Hello, and welcome today to today's webinar, Sepsis Standard Work, Improving Compliance with Early Recognition and Management of Perinatal Sepsis. Thank you for tuning in to today's webinar. My name is Kate Wiedemann, and I am a Health Communication Specialist in CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. The mission of CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion is to protect patients, protect healthcare personnel, and promote safety, quality, and value in both national and international healthcare delivery systems. This webinar is part of a series of infection control related webinars that CDC will be hosting with a variety of external partners and experts. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. We welcome your questions. Please submit any questions or comments you have via your chat window located on the lower left-hand side of the webinar screen anytime during the presentation. Questions will be addressed after all presentations as time allows. To ask for help, please press the raise hand button located at the top left-hand side of the screen if you need to chat with a meeting chairperson for assistance, such as for technical difficulties during the webinar. To hear the audio, please ensure your speakers are turned on with the volume up. The audio for today's conference should be coming through your computer speakers. In addition, the speaker slides have been sent to all participants via email and will also be provided to participants in a follow-up email. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Ross from the American Nurses Association who will be providing an introduction for today's webinar, along with Dr. Elizabeth Rochin from the Association of Women's Health, Obstetric, and Neonatal Nurses. Dr. Ross? Thank you, Kate. The American Nurses Association represents the interests of the nation's 3.6 million nurses. ANA has a longstanding involvement in infection prevention and control, and recent emerging disease threats have presented unique opportunities for formalized collaboration with organizations such as the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As the largest and most trusted profession for the last 15 years, nurses are uniquely qualified to identify and prevent the spread of infections like sepsis. Nurses spend the most time with patients and their families, providing them with opportunities to prevent, identify, and treat infections. ANA has several infection prevention and control online resources on the www.nursingworld.org website. The first is CAUTI, Catheter Associated Urinary Tract Infection Prevention Tool, developed by a team of experts, including ANA members, representatives from specialty nursing organizational affiliates, infection control specialists, and patient safety authorities, nurse consultants from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, Partners for Patients, PFP team and representatives from CDC were included in the panel. The one-page tool is based on the CDC's 2009 Guideline for Prevention of Catheter-Associated Urinary Tract Infections and incorporates an algorithm to determine if a urinary catheter is appropriately based on nurse screening and assessment as well as alternatives for retention and continence, timely removal, and a checklist on catheter insertion, cues for essential maintenance, and post-removal care. The Safe Patient Handling and Mobility website provides several resources, including an online assessment tool to identify facilities, successes, and opportunities for improvement, YouTube videos on early mobility and safe patient handling standards, and other educational resource packages. The ANA APIC Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Resource Center is a centralized web-based information site birthed from the lessons learned from the Ebola crisis. ANA APIC and other external stakeholders sought to identify and address knowledge gaps in evidence-based infection prevention and control practices among their members. The NICE Network, or Nursing Infection Control Education Network, 
is the official brand for a two-year CDC contract. The CDC network seeks to empower nurses to pro- protect themselves and their patients by providing real-time tailored infection control training to nurses. It is the hope that the educational materials and trainings developed through the NICE network will increase nurses' adherence to and confidence in infection control protocols from the prevention of healthcare associated infections to provide care for patients with highly contagious diseases. Now introducing Dr. Roshan from A1. Thank you, Dr. Ross, and good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Roshan, and I'm the Vice President of Nursing at A1, the Association of Women's Health, Obstetrics, and Neonatal Nurses. Collaborative interdisciplinary care and teamwork are hallmarks of effective sepsis prevention and early detection. We as obstetric nurses play a pivotal role in this process, and it is very important to better understand the contextual aspects of this essential work. Maternal sepsis continues to be a clinical challenge worldwide. On a global scale, maternal sepsis is the leading cause of death, accounting for 15% of maternal deaths worldwide. Closer to home in the United States, maternal sepsis is considered to be the leading cause of death in the peripartum period. As we explore the demographic and patient history context, we see recurrent themes that are associated with other maternal morbidity and mortality reports. Specifically through the lens of sepsis, we see the demographic characteristics such as advanced maternal age, race, and those who are covered by Medicaid to have had reported associations. In addition, Patient medical and surgical history lends itself to associations with the diagnosis of sepsis, particularly surgical interventions and other maternal morbidity and mortality diagnoses, such as postpartum hemorrhage. As we just discussed, health and racial disparities within maternal morbidity and mortality in general must be recognized and addressed. This trend you see is unsustainable and must be considered a call to action by all who are participating on this call. There is another alarming trend that also must be highlighted. Calgan and his colleagues reviewed nearly 50 million obstetric visits over a period of 10 years within the national inpatient sample. During this time, no significant increases or changes in sepsis diagnoses were found prior to delivery. However, during this same time period, post-delivery sepsis rates increased by 148%. It is data such as this that was the foundation of a new postpartum discharge education toolkit that was developed and launched by AWAN in 2016. Specific discharge information targets specific conditions such as sepsis, hemorrhage, preeclampsia, and others that may place new mothers at risk for morbidity and mortality post-delivery. In closing, you will hear from all of our speakers today, early detection is key to successful prevention and treatment. From a healthcare provider perspective, what is the primary preventative measure we can offer? You guessed it, good hand washing. As sepsis may be difficult to identify, particularly during labor, as symptoms may be similar, it is critical to understand the pathophysiology and physiologic changes of pregnancy that may mask sepsis diagnosis. Interdisciplinary training, simulation, and teamwork is vital to assure systems and processes are in place to provide care to the mother if indeed sepsis is suspected or identified. Communication and teamwork strategies, such as code sepsis OB programs and team steps training, provide the foundation for coordinated efforts and assure skillful and timely care is available in the perinatal setting. Thank you for the opportunity for AWAN to contribute to this essential work. I would now like to introduce Dr. Laura Epstein, who will provide the CDC Vital Signs Overview. Thank you. The CDC Vital Signs is a monthly report that was published in 2010. Each vital signs report is linked to a scientific publication from CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report and highlights important public health issues using a graphic fact sheet and website, a media release, and a social media tool. In August 2016, we published a vital signs focusing on sepsis. Today, I'm going to present some of the key findings and messages from the report and next steps. 
we conducted a pilot assessment of patients with sepsis and performed a retrospective chart review in four New York hospitals. Medical records of 325 patients, both adults and children, were reviewed to better describe the epidemiology of sepsis, including demographics, underlying clinical characteristics, and infections leading to sepsis. This was published in CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. As part of the sepsis vital signs report, key findings were highlighted from the analysis. We found that sepsis most often occurs in people over the age of 65 or infants less than one year of age, or among people with chronic diseases, such as diabetes or weakened immune systems. Sepsis is most often associated with infections of the lung, urinary tract, skin, or gut, and common pathogens that are the cause of sepsis are Staph aureus, E. coli, and some types of strep, although a majority of patients do not have a pathogen identified. Finally, while healthy adults, children, and while healthy infants, children, and adults can develop sepsis from an infection, especially if not identified and treated properly, this is less common. We found that sepsis begins outside the hospital for nearly 80% of patients. In addition, seven in 10 patients with sepsis had recently interacted with healthcare providers or had chronic diseases requiring frequent medical care. Overall, there are opportunities for better prevention of infections that lead to sepsis and improvement of recognition of sepsis. The report highlighted the important role of healthcare providers regarding sepsis prevention and recognition. We encourage providers to talk to patients and families regarding signs and symptoms of sepsis, infections that lead to sepsis, and how infections that can lead to sepsis can be prevented or recognized early, and what to do when an infection is not getting better. In addition, healthcare providers should act quickly if sepsis is suspected. Based on this pilot assessment, we are expanding the project to 10 sites throughout the U.S using CDC's Emerging Infections Program Network. Data collection is currently underway, and the goal is to further describe underlying characteristics of patients with sepsis and septic shock and identify opportunities for prevention. We are also conducting a national sepsis educational effort to improve sepsis prevention, early suspicion, and recognition, leading to timely treatment. The launch is scheduled for fall 2017. Anticipated outcomes of the campaign include increased awareness of sepsis and prevention of infections that lead to sepsis. Additionally, the goal is to increase awareness of the need for rapid recognition and prompt treatment, especially in areas outside of acute care facilities. Thank you. Please visit the CDC Vital Science webpage for more information. Now we'll hand it over to Dr. Sean Townsend. Dr. Townsend? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, be a part of uh, this presentation today on maternal fetal sepsis and uh, the opportunities to address early recognition in maternal sepsis in particular. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce two of my colleagues at uh, Sutter Health uh, who will be presenting uh, our key information on this topic. Um, the first colleague is Dr. Katerina Lanarkusen. Uh, she's medical director uh, at the Women's Services in Sutter Health at Alta Debates Medical Center in Berkeley, California. Dr. Lanarkusen is the co-chair for the OBGYN Quality Committee for Sutter Health, a healthcare organization delivering approximately 33,000 babies each year. She was part of the leadership team for the implementation of the early recognition of perinatal sepsis for the, sorry, uh, the Sutter Health perinatal population. In addition, I'll introduce her colleague as well, Dr. Uh, rather, Lori Olvera, a bedside nurse at Sutter Medical Center Sacramento's Anderson Lucchetti Women's and Children's Center. Lori was a sepsis lead for rollout of sepsis bundles for maternal sepsis at Sutter Sacramento, as well as a regional rollout in Sutter Health uh, for the same. Lori is currently working in collaboration with Holly Champagne to roll out to Kaiser Sacramento, as well as a regional rollout for Kaiser Hospitals for early recognition and management of maternal sepsis. So without further ado, I would introduce them both and turn the presentation over. Hi, this is Lori Olvera. And this is Katerina lanier Cousin. And I will say it's no coincidence uh, that we are a team presenting to you because uh, it's essential for a successful implementation of sepsis screening 
that it is an interdisciplinary team that leads the implementation. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Townsend for a wonderful introduction, and also I want to thank the CDC A1 ANA and Society of Critical Care Medicine for sponsoring this uh, webinar. The objectives we're going to cover are effectively implement the OB sepsis screen in the perinatal population using adjusted parameters for the systemic inflammatory response to identify the importance of implementing protocols for early recognition and management of uh, perinatal sepsis, and to identify the barriers to implementation of sepsis bundles in early recognition recognition and management of perinatal sepsis and how to overcome them. And here is the history of sepsis in an abbreviated format and the perinatal population. And so in 2001, uh, the River study showed that adult patients admitted to the ICU with severe sepsis and septic shock are less likely to die when early directed uh, therapy is used. And the mortality rate was 16% lower in the patients that received the early goal-directed therapy. So guidelines for the care of sepsis was published in 2004. The perinatal population were not included. Uh, perinatal patients are young and healthy, and septic shock is rare. The normal physiology of pregnancy can mimic early signs of a sepsis. So, however, when reviewing the causes, which you have already now heard, uh, the cause of pregnancy-related death in the United States between 2006 to 2010, uh, infection and sepsis was the second leading cause. So now, gradually, sepsis screening has become more and more the standard in the perinatal population. And you are also aware of that the Center of Medicaid and Medicare Services that link quality and safety with measures of reimbursement for hospitals has become an essential driver for hospitals to proceed with uh, sepsis screening. And here again, you see how through 2011 to 2013, again, the uh, sepsis was validated as an important uh, cause of uh, perinatal death in patients. So in this slide, <clears throat> it shows the severe sepsis and septic shock for the adult population at Sutter Sacramento. And this was um, the mortality rates, the blue line that goes across the screen is the mortality rates depicted. The pregnant patients weren't um, taken out of, uh, it just, this is just all adult patients. So you can see uh, in September 2015, the mortality rate was uh, 28%. When we started our rollout and implemented sepsis screening, early recognition, we adjusted our SIRS criteria for the perinatal population. That was actually in February 2016. You can see that the mortality rates you know, were lower at that point, um, but then it kind of jumped up again, and, it, and so it has a jagged effect. However, since about August 2016, we've kind of seen a stabilization of the mortality rates, and we're thinking that this is probably um, going to reflect, you know, our good work that we've done at Sutter Health, showing that our mortality rates are, are decreasing. I want to emphasize that um, we have, we, um, the patient, it was, our screening for patients were um, varied depending on what type of patient, but the response was the same. We had the RRT come to the bedside and evaluate the screen, and the treatment was the same no matter where the location of the patient was. Um, so we have the same response throughout the hospital. So what do we know about pregnancy and sepsis? We know that septic shock is rare in the pregnant population. And of all septic patients, approximately half of a percent are pregnant. And there has been noted to be an overall increase in severe sepsis and septic shock, uh, mostly due to demographic changes of pregnant women. 
And as noted before, advanced maternal age is important, obesity, diabetes, Severe complications of pregnancy, such as placental abruption, placental abnormalities, and also assisted reproductive technology has played a role. And emerging infections are also an important uh, uh, contributor worldwide with uh, significant respiratory viruses. And also, we all remember Ebola, Ebola and how it ravished uh, West Africa. And there are also emerging bacterial infections, uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, for example, and vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus. So due to all traveling that can occur in the world, uh, I think as caregivers, we have to pay attention uh, to the emerging infections as well. So this was actually um, in, in, the Bar in the Green Journal. This is an article uh, written by Barton and Sabai in 2012. It was a fantastic article. It's a must read. Um, it talks about how pregnant patients need to be included in our sepsis protocols. And in the abstract, it states the following. Pregnancy is complicated by severe sepsis and septic shock are associated with increased rates of preterm labor, fetal infection, and preterm delivery. Sepsis onset in pregnancy can be insidious, and patients may appear deceptively well before rapidly deteriorating with the development of severe shock, multi multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, or death. The outcome and survivability uh, in severe sepsis and septic shock in pregnancy are improved with early detection, prompt recognition of the source of infection, and targeted therapy. Dr. Olvera, I'm, my apologies for interrupting. Um, some yes. folks on the phone are having a hard time hearing you. Would there be any way you could get a little bit closer to your phone so that we can hear you? Um, can you hear me now? I mean, I'm. That's can you much hear better. Me now? Is it? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. So what does the literature say? Sepsis is actually one of the top four causes of maternal mortality. Pregnant p women are more vulnerable to infection and susceptible to serious complications. The, um, the immune system in a pregnant uh, woman is downregulated to protect the fetus. And so uh, pregnant women are actually very susceptible to infection and getting very sick. Screening protocols are needed for early recognition management in maternal sepsis, and all perinatal staff must be trained on early recognition and management of maternal sepsis. So it's really important that um, um, to educate every department where a, uh, where a pregnant patient may exist. For example, you know the ED, the ICU, as well as like your labor units, your postpartum units, and high-risk maternity units. Um, it's really important that, to train all staff. So why do we need protocols for early recognition? Early recognition and treatment of maternal sepsis will improve survival, decrease length of stay and length of stay in the ICU. And it makes sense. You know, a patient with septic shock, gets, you know, they, ha they get very sick, they get hypotensive, they're, um, they go to the ICU, they can be intubated, um, they're in the hospital for a long time. What we want to do is create a system where we intervene when the patient is, is displaying subtle signs such, such as the systemic inflammatory response criteria. Delay in diagnosis and treatment of sepsis has been shown to increase mortality. The uh, Sutter Health Sepsis Initiative in the perinatal population uh, was implemented in early 2016 uh, with an overarching goal of reducing morbidity and mortality. And I will just mention morbidity in this population can go all from separating mother and baby for prolonged periods of time uh, with associated with difficulties of breastfeeding and this morbidity can then ultimately also include operative procedures, hysterectomy, and even more complicated surgical procedure, uh, bowel resections, skin transplants, etc. 
So morbidity can be quite significant. The uh, mortality also has been noted uh, to be significant at times in this population. So the implementation strategies of early recognition and treatment was uh, with a chance to alter the outcome. And we use standard work, which I think many of you are familiar with because lean has become a strategy at many uh, hospitals. And so that was the approach uh, that was adopted that had been used in manufacturing as well to reduce the variation in care and errors of omission. So what can we do? <clears throat> we want to improve the recognition of sepsis in the perinatal population. Um, we want to ad adopt best practices and provide recommended care. And the recommended care is um, ICU level care for a patient who is hypotensive despite giving the fluid boluses or a lactate greater than 3.9. Best practices are based on organizations with the lowest mor sepsis mortality. It's protocol driven, early recognition, and escalation of care or I ICU level care. Code sepsis and OB, let's intervene before it hits. This slide was actually from a video that we made. It's a, I, I think it was a very good video that we did. It was actually an educational video for, for um, healthcare professionals. And in this slide, we're um, trying to resuscitate a woman who's in septic shock. The mortality rate is like 30 to 60 percent, dependent upon the source of infection. So we all kind of know what to do at this stage, but what we want to do is create a system where we're not intervening at this point. We're intervening a lot earlier. And once again, it's, it's when the uh, woman is presenting and has a subtle vital sign changes such as the systemic inflammatory response criteria. So uh, what do we do? What steps do we follow when we do sepsis screening? So first, we need uh, to define what this systemic inflammatory uh, response is, which is a, a clinical manifestation uh, that occurs from an insult. And these insults could be trauma, pancreatitis, and here we're focusing on infection as the trauma. And this uh, will result in a body-wide activation of the immune and the inflammatory cascade. Uh, so why does uh, sepsis uh, kill. And the importance is that the infection develops, uh, cascade activation and mediator release follow. And if the infection progresses to sepsis and severe sepsis, the systemic and body-wide inflammatory response uh, leads to widespread vasodilatation, capillary permeability, cellular activation, and derangements in the coagulation. And if this response is not uh, stopped, then it leads to uh, a circulatory collapse, hyperperfusion, and possible death. Uh, so uh, this response can be normal and protective for the body, uh, but if it is not treated, then the outcome can be very severe. And what you see at the bottom of this slide uh, is a link uh, to a presentation of sepsis uh, in a YouTube that was produced by the Cat University. And it is a, an excellent presentation of the devastation of the systemic inflammatory response. And this link was particularly popular when uh, we rolled out our initiative uh, because it was uh, nine minutes and 58 seconds of excellent education. So because of the physiology of pregnancy, we knew that we had to adjust the screening, to, uh, 
criteria for the perinatal population. So we looked at the physiology of pregnancy um, and looked at what factors um, <clears throat> we needed to adjust. So uh, in the pregnant woman, there, there's an increase in blood volume that increases the maternal heart rate by 10 to 20 beats. The minute volume increases 50% due to an increase in respiratory rate and tidal volume. The position of the diaphragm due to, due to the growing fetus decreases the lung volume and increases the respiratory rate. There's an increase in WBCs or leukocytosis in labor and immediate postpartum. Now, I will tell you that any OB will tell you that, um, that WBCs can go as high as 20,000 in the absence of infection. But we actually looked at our, um, we looked at like 99 patients that screened positive over, over a 10-month period. And actually their, their initial WBC was somewhere around 14, 15. It was not a, a large number when they, they first presented or when they screened in positive. Um, we also uh, noted that there was an increase in perfusion to the kidneys that caused a decrease in the creatinine level. So this is actually the SERS criteria comparison. You can see on the left is the adult screening criteria and the right is the perinatal screening criteria. And anything that you see bolded in red were the um, vital signs or factors that we actually adjusted. The heart rate we adjusted from 90 to um, greater than 110 for the perinatal top, uh, patient. The respiratory rate is greater than 24 breaths per minute. The WBC is greater than 15,000, less than 4,000, <clears> or greater than 10% immature neutrophils. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. There. Okay. This, this is actually, um, I call it the elevator speech because it's an arrow that we used um, to show as we were educating staff um, from, least, if you, from least mortality and as it grows of greatest mortality. So we, so we start out with a suspicion of infection and, and then as, as the patient is allowed to progress along the continuum, they can actually go to septic shock. We looked at the SERS criteria. There was a lot of discussion around the SERS criteria. Um, we looked at what the ACOG recommendations uh, were for um, SERS criteria and the adjustments. We looked at local, we looked at actually hospitals in general, general and Dignity had had um, um, screening criteria that they developed. And after much discussion, we came up with our own, our own parameters. We're, sorry for this. We're, I'll just let you. I'll there. let you adjust. This is, yeah, uh, we're returning to the arrow, and uh, uh, we can see how the continuum uh, of the inflammatory response can lead to severe sepsis, uh, which is the combination of sepsis and end organ damage. And here is where you see the criteria for the end organ damage. So the Survivor Sepsis Campaign are the values that you see highlighted in the green column. And in the yellow column, you see the Sutter Health parameters that were chosen. And so the differences are actually not very significant, but it involves uh, the uh, oxygen saturation, which we determined to be any time when it's less than 92%. I'm sorry, this is not our latest version, so uh, I would just speak to it uh, more precisely. And also when the urine output uh, was uh, less than 30 cc's over two hour time span. And also, as mentioned earlier, uh, there needed to be an adjustment for the creatinine. So instead of using values larger than two, we used values above uh, 1.5. And then I just wanted for a moment to address lactate 
because usually uh, obstetricians uh, are not very familiar with using sepsis, uh, using lactate as an evaluation tool. So there was quite significant emphasis on teaching around uh, the uh, lactate levels. So here we go and getting further along in the path uh, of uh, the severe sepsis. Uh, and now we have addressed the organ uh, damage. So um, what then occurred often is um, a dismissal of the abnormal values. And this slide is all thanks to uh, Dr. Townsend. And uh, because it really brought up uh, how many times when values are noted, uh, there is a, oh, this is seen often, and it has no significance, particularly in the postpartum period. And the fever was explained by just an increased metabolic demand. And tachycardia was due to a relative hypovolemia that many times could be tolerated by the young woman. And again, coming back to the leukocytosis, which was just due to the stress of delivery. And even mild hypotension could be dismissed uh, because of possible hypovolemia in a young woman uh, with a physiologically low blood pressure. So this is uh, an important uh, issue to address in education. So how did we implement early recognition as part of our standard work? Sorry. Uh, I will advance, Lori. Got it. <laughs> Actually, what we needed to do, we, ha we started with a multidisciplinary team. We included ICU, um, and the ER, we included um, pharmacy, lab, leadership team, educators, um, physicians, nurses from um, all the units. We had champions from every unit to be a part of the multidisciplinary team. The focus actually was of the team was to create that workflow and have uh, decisions. And so, it, so once again, it was important to have everybody represented. We came, go back. Thank you. It, we started out actually doing we we developed actually a workflow and and then we we moved on with our education. We actually started out doing the physician education first. It was really important to educate the, the physicians and also to um, get their feedback into the process. So because when we implemented it out to the rest of the organization, we wanted to make sure that we had a very concise, workable system that everybody agreed on. So um, we spent a good time um, educating physicians at their physician attended meetings. We uh, did interprofessional education for all staff. Once again, we wanted it to be successful. We wanted all staff to know about the, the standard work that was going to be implemented. We developed a new uh, perinatal sepsis physician order set, and that order set actually was a pre-checked item of once a, pers a, a, a woman screened in positive for sepsis that it was a standardized method for treatment of uh, labs that we would order, antibiotics that we would order according, according to the uh, source of infection and the fluid boluses. And then last but not least, we, it was really crucial to have physician and RN champions. You know, physician champions, uh, the physician champion wa was crucial because they actually, physicians listen to physicians, and so if there was things that needed to be addressed with the physicians, we used our physician lead. Um, our RN champions were very crucial because, of course, a patient is not um, 
present at 8 o'clock in the morning. A patient will be there at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so we had champions on every shift. So when that patient presented, that there was somebody to mentor that newer nurse or somebody or that nurse who did not know the, who was least familiar with the workflow. Next slide. And Lori is extremely correct about this. It required a significant multidisciplinary team uh, where every skill set was equally valued uh, in order for it to be successful. So our standard work for perinatal sepsis included initiating sepsis screening every shift. Um, it was, you know, every shift um, or when the patient transferred or as necessary for a new infection, but we started screening every, every patient. We created protocols and standardized procedures for, with, um, with SERS criteria for maternal sepsis. We, we had early intervention implemented for all patients who screened positive, as I spoke earlier on. And then the arrival of the ra rapid response team, which was quite new for our department. Um, the, we had the intensivist evaluation as needed, so when a patient was hypotensive and uh, wasn't responding to the fluid boluses or the lactate was greater than 3.9, that, that we had an intensivist come and evaluate. Um, the OB physician, of course, was notified and part of that team collaboration of where the best location was for that patient. And I don't know if you all have rapid response teams, uh, but our rapid response team, which is the same as Lori mentioned, includes a respiratory therapist and an ICU nurse that will then evaluate uh, the uh, patient. And another important uh, component of this implementation uh, was uh, the uh, creation of a severe sepsis order set, which Lori mentioned earlier, uh, because uh, that standardized the treatment of the patient and gave very good directions uh, for the obstetricians of the selection of antibiotics, for example, the flow of laboratory tests, as well uh, as the fluid resuscitation. And here is a uh, sheet, the instruction sheet for standard work. And I'm only showing this because uh, we all worked very hard at creating this. And it's a very good depiction of the process. And uh, I always think of this as something that you print out, fold, and put in your back pocket because it gives you all the instruction you need uh, when you encounter the patient. Uh, so if any of you are interested, we would be very happy uh, to forward you uh, the standard work um, because it's very valuable. So this is actually um, our sepsis alert process or our standard work process. A patient who's screening, uh, who has an infection is screening positive for sepsis. Uh, sepsis, uh, the rapid response team responds to the bedside. A sepsis alert is, is um, called. It um, involves a lab responding to the bedside to draw CBC, CMP, lactate, blood cultures. We uh, start broad spectrum antibiotics. Our goal is to get it within an hour. And IV fluids, 30 mils per kg if the patient is hypotensive. And we have radiology and pharmacy on alert. And of course, the physician is notified. And if the patient is presenting more, uh, looking more septic shock, like with a lactate greater than 3.9 or hypotensive, despite that fluids, the ICU physician is um, notified. If the patient has um, severe sepsis, um, or, or, or I should say just has org, um, uh, organ dysfunction, then once again the rapid response team is called to the bedside to help uh, mentor in the workflow. The broad spectrum antibiotics are started if they haven't already been administered. We give it 30 mils per kg uh, for lactate 2 to 3.9. 
Um, and we repeat the lactate every three hours until we get a lactate less than two. Um, if, if we're not being able to monitor the urinary output or um, there's a question, then we will place a urinary catheter for strict INO if needed. An O2 SAT monitor is placed, oxygen is given um, per protocol. And then um, if the systolic BP is less than 90 or a lactate greater than 3.9, a code sepsis is called. This is the overhead page and it alerts the ICU, the ICU charge nurse and uh, pharmacy lab. Um, and it's a great system um, and it actually then we, it's initiating that six hour bundle where we can consider, you know, whether the, the uh, patient needs central line or do we need to give vasopressors. And once again, that would be done via escalation of care or done in the ICU. And here is a depiction of the code sepsis where the RN notifies the OB physician. The OB physician assess for criteria of septic shock. And if that has been documented, the OB physician notifies the ICU physician. And the ICU physician uh, comes to the bedside, evaluate the patient. And uh, if uh, the ICU physician recommends for the patient to be transferred for the ICU, that is uh, uh, what will then occur. And this has led to uh, more intense and appropriate care uh, and earlier treatment uh, for the patient. So we wanted to share um, uh, some of the um, data that we had from our rollout. And um, there's actually, the, we're just sharing a couple tables in uh, the article I wrote in the A1 journal about early recognition. There is actually more data for you to see. Um, Next slide. So the source of infection in perinatal uh, patients, this was actually a 10-month uh, period uh, collected data. It was 99 patients. Uh, one of the things um, we looked at was the source of infection. The choreo, as we're not surprised, was 46.4% was the initial source of infection. Uh, pyelonephritis, 14.4%. Uh, endometritis, 5.2%. Urinary tract infection was 5.2%. And what was kind of surprising is unknown etiology is 29%. So that kind of told, that told us that we really needed to be able to look at how our ID team, um, and our ID and pharma pharmacy with antibiotic stewardship to look at what was the best antibiotics to give for unknown etiology. Um, because um, it was such a high number. Next slide. So looking se at sepsis, severe sepsis and septic shock, this is actually, um, a, um, if you look to the far left, when you look at a patient sepsis screen positive, we had 99 patients with a 4,000 delivery rate during that, that time period. So it was 0.024%, uh, which is a very low low number. This, screen, this observation was actually very crucial to our organization when we did a regional rollout because everybody thought that when we uh, roll this out that everybody would be screening in positive for sepsis. So this would convince our, our team um, that it was actually going to be a very low number that screened in. Looking at severe sepsis, once again, very low number. It was 47 out of 4,000 deliveries, 0.012%, and then septic shock, was, which is 0.002%. And just this actually was the same, uh, the same number as when the slide earlier when we talked about septic shock as rare. So it kind of our data kind of matched what it said in the literature. Looking at the second observation was that um, we had an RRT come out to actually validate the screen when, when we had a woman uh, screen in positive for sepsis. They were just there to concur. We found 98% of the time our nurses were right on with their assessments. Um, of those 99 patients, 
47 out of 97 were actually uh, had severe sepsis. That was 48.5%. Uh, so that was over half actually went on to get severe sepsis, and 7.2% and um, went on to get um, septic shock. We had to address the barriers, um, and there, you know, we had several barriers, and it was, it, I always recommend to address the barriers before you implement it, because the common themes will come up. The, one of the common themes is our patients are young and healthy, they don't look septic. Um, that our bundles will result in over-treatment. You know, once again, going um, back to the data, there was not very many patients that actually screened in positive. And we also, um, we, the education we did for staff is that we actually create uh, standardization in our healthcare that sometimes results in, t in over-treatment. However, we want to save that person who, who would die of septic shock. Um, and I actually correlated how we treat our GBS, uh, we do our GBS screening um, as kind of a correlation of the same type of workflow, you know, um, that. Uh, also, also, what I will thing. say, uh, there was big debates about the lactate. Um, and so uh, that there was big objections to the fact that a laboring woman would normally have an increased lactate. And it's very few studies that have been published. So um, there was no absolute good solution to what the lactate would be in laboring women, though I know that Sutter Sacramento and Lori, they did studies on the lactate levels in laboring women, and it turned out that they were not significantly different than in anybody else. And another big issue became the a second stage of labor and whether you should screen at all. And so um, I think ultimately where we ended up was that screening occurs in the second stage of labor because now with the new emphasis on allowing the second stage to proceed for a longer period of time, it becomes important to screen the patient, but also to add the clinical situation. And so usually we will say if the delivery is imminent, then we will rescreen after the patient delivers. But all of this were barriers uh, that had to be addressed and is continuously addressed um, as time uh, proceeds. So let's begin the campaign and promote early recognition and management of maternal sepsis. Think sa sepsis and save a life. Well, so thank you now very much. We're going to turn it back to Dr. Townsend. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Dr. Lana Cousin and uh, uh, Lori Oliveira. I appreciate um, your informative uh, presentation. There have been a number of questions that you can see have come up in the chat in the side of the um, presentation during the course of your comments. Um, a couple general questions came up, and I'd like to address those to you. Uh, first. The first uh, question came from Susan Emmerich, uh, and the question was, have there been any reasons identified as to why black women are at so much more risk of sepsis than white women? Is it correlated with increased surgical intervention? Uh, so uh, what I can address is uh, it so is that at our site where we deliver 6,000 babies, our patient population is 20% Afro-American. And uh, we then also, as a corollary to that, have uh, a more significant presence of cardiovascular disease and preeclampsia. So that then leads to some of uh, the issues that was uh, presented earlier as to what increases risk of sepsis, uh, which is, for example, placental abruption. And so I think that is a contributing factor. And then obviously it can't go unmentioned uh, regarding access of care and at which state in the evolution of infection a patient presents. 
so those would be some of the explanations uh, for a higher rate in the Afro-American woman. Uh, very interesting. Another question from Kevin Cavanaugh. If sepsis starts outside of the hospital in 80% of patients, how can staff hand washing be viewed as the primary intervention needed for prevention? Hi, this is Lauren Epstein from CDC. I can go ahead and answer this. So um, in our analysis, we did see that, and I think that this has been shown in the literature, that most patients that come in with sepsis, and, and about 80% come in from, um, present to the hospital with sepsis or within the first 48 hours. But that doesn't mean that they haven't had interactions with healthcare. A lot of these patients have underlying medical risk, and underlying risk factors or had interaction with healthcare. And so we know that hand hygiene is one of the ways that we can prevent infections. We also know that among the other 20% of um, patients that develop sepsis within the hospital actually have worse outcomes. So we know that there's lots of opportunities for prevention, and we know that hand hygiene in any situation is important. So that's one, one, one area that we know that is good infection prevention, and there's always rooms for improvement. And also, it could uh, stop the propagation of infection within the hospital, for sure. Well, absolutely. Very difficult to argue against hand hygiene in virtually any circumstance. Uh, so appreciate the answers. These are following questions are for Dr. Uh, Leonard Cuisin and Lori Alvera. First question is from Laura Murrell. I'm spearheading a sepsis awareness in my facility. Currently, I'm having great progress with the adult sepsis, and now I'm being asked to develop pediatric, neonatal, and maternal sepsis protocols. I was wondering if Dr. Leonard Cuisin and Dr. Oliveira had some ideas to send me that I could use to help expedite my implementation. Thank you. So regarding the maternal uh, sepsis and the screening, uh, we can obviously contribute uh, from our experience. And again, it comes back to what Lori presented uh, about the uh, steps that are so essential in order to be successful, uh, which is the multidisciplinary team and it's uh, very essential to find, um, now if you have the luxury of finding a nurse like Lori, that would be great, and also if you have perinatologists on staff, they are essential uh, to participate in an implementation. Um, so I think Lori might have some other suggestions as well. Um, we would, um, well, we actually have um, tools. I have tools that I shared actually in my article, but um, also I can, I'm willing to share um, tools that I have, um, and I'm just thinking I can, I can email these tools to you. Um, and I, I We can send a follow-up email well. after the webinar um, with the tools that you want to provide. Great. Okay, perfect. Very good. Um, the next question is from Martha Deed. May be a seasonal association with frequency of sepsis on your line chart. Watching the rate this summer would confirm what you have already that you have reduced frequency overall. I think the question goes to: Is there a so seasonal association with the frequency of sepsis on the chart you described? And then, uh, would uh, there be evidence to suggest that watching the rate this summer? So is this addressing the graph that Lori presented? Yes. I think it is. Yes. Um, I, don't, I cannot that. address, except for the respiratory viruses that obviously have uh, significant seasonal variations. I am not sure that uh, I see can address a seasonal variation in bacterial infection, and maybe Dr. Townsend has some insight if that uh, is the case. This is Lauren. Well, I do. I, sure, oh. go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that we have seen some seasonal variation of sepsis in some of the analysis that we've done, because we know that most uh -huh. causes of sepsis are, we have seen seasonal variation of sepsis. Um, we think, we know that most causes of sepsis are respiratory, so it does follow um, uh, common uh, respiratory pads that we've seen. And it, just from my perspective, uh, from the surviving sepsis campaign and the data we've examined, uh, as well as the data I've examined within Sutter Health uh, for patients, 
we do see in particular in the fall with the rise of respiratory illness in adults, not specific to uh, the maternal sepsis population, um, an increased frequency of the diagnosis. So it, it's, it's likely to occur. Um, it's something we should pay attention to and reinterpret information. There's a good question here from Mary Shoup. She states, at my hospital, we screen all maternal patients for sepsis on admission every shift and with declining condition. We're looking for a tool or guidance on early identification on chorioamnionitis in particular. So um, I reviewed some of our data, uh, and the way the data came to me, I received those women who had had a lactate over two. And in that group of patients were uh, many of the chorioamnionitis patients. And so I think from looking at that, that um, there is early identification of chorioamnionitis. I think that most obstetricians have become very um, focused on uh, the early detection of chorioamnionitis because it has a significant impact on the baby. So I think that we are actually achieved quite a success at identifying chorioamnionitis early. And I don't know that we can succeed, or I can't think of any other ways to do it. What happened in many of these oh. situations is as soon as the sepsis alert was called by the nurse, the RRT team and the obstetrician actually arrived almost simultaneously, and the patient received care. Thank you. Katerina, I hate to interrupt you, but we need to close uh, the questioning period, and there are so many questions that we won't be able to get to all of them, but I appreciate the excellent presentations from all the presenters, and I turn it back oh. to the uh, staff, uh, CDC staff, for further uh, commentary. Thank you, Dr. Townsend. Um, before we end today's webinar, I want to provide instructions to receive continuing education. To receive continuing education, you must complete and pass the post-test activity at 70% and complete the webinar evaluation. When you close out of the webinar, a post-meeting web page will appear that will have detailed instructions about completing the continuing education, post-test, and evaluation. For those on the phone who currently aren't logged into the ReadyTalk platform online, to obtain continuing education, please go to www.cdc.gov backslash TCE online the access code for this webinar is WC0517. If you are listening to this webinar as a recording, please check the Tune into Safe Healthcare webinar page for instructions for claiming continuing education. A follow-up email will also be sent after the webinar with detailed instructions about completing the continuing education post-test and evaluation. And with that, I'd like to thank our speakers, as well as all of you for taking the time to join us today and for your commitment to keeping patients safe. Thank you very much.